it's a weird time to be a queer Catholic in Portland right now, because like in the little bubble of my church and my family, I feel like extremely affirmed and validated and loved and supported. And then you mm. set like one foot outside <laughs> that bubble. And it's just like, oh, everybody hates me. Wow. <laughs> First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things. Let's specifically make you Hey, I'm Tim Barnes. You are the genre. And in every episode of this show, I ask a great guest about the first genre that inspired them, the first craft that they pursued, and how they feel about that first pursuit now. And I do that because I've learned in my own creative journey that those three questions help guide you towards what you really want to do and why you really want to be doing it. In this episode, I'm talking to Portland native Claire Willett. Claire is a playwright, novelist, former Catholic youth minister, and nonprofit grant writer. I know Claire because of the internet. She pops up in a lot of fan circles, especially in the realm of Star Trek, which I'm a big fan of. And we had been trying for weeks to schedule the very conversation you're about to hear. And the fact that you're about to hear it means that that conversation actually took place. Or did it? I mean, seeing as how Claire's first novel titled The Rewind Files is a time travel adventure about Watergate, anything is possible. I'm so glad we finally were able to do this. This has been a crazy journey trying to find the time to record. And I hope that there that you didn't log in to this link and find nothing a couple weeks ago. No, no. We, <laughs> no, we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a lot going on, it sounds like. Yes, yes, had a lot going on. Part of it exciting, part of it a little, uh, you know, tragic, uh, you know, uh, deaths in the family, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, we all somehow find a balance in the arts, yeah. don't we? Yeah, yeah. I, I had I, similar ups and downs this year, death in the family in February, and then I was sick for three months. And it just, I feel like I don't know anybody for whom this has not been like a uniquely weird and brutal year. Yes, right? That, <laughs> that's part of why I started this show, too, to try and see how everyone is dealing with it, because it's it's a pretty strange reality that we're all in with, uh, you know, being creative people specifically. Yeah. Where everybody is struggling. We all kind of know exactly why, but we don't know what to do. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and we all feel like we're the only ones it's happening to. So even if you can't do anything about it, I think there's just such value in knowing like okay you know what at least it's like it's everybody like i'm not yeah. the only person <laughs> and i know that you were a big part of helping out specifically through uh, star trek helping out during the wga strike yeah and uh that was the beautiful thing about the strike was that we all kind of broke down these walls because you always kind of end up putting up this uh brave face for what you're doing creatively. You don't want to let people know that you're in limbo or whatever, but knowing what so many people have gone through <laughs> yeah. is all super helpful. Yeah. Well, and I, I thought that was so, that experience I think was really powerful for, well, I mean, for a lot of reasons, one of which I think was just that I thought the WGA did a tremendous job in communicating, like really clearly breaking down sort of the nitty gritty in a way that people who are not in the industry could relate to. So you could look at, you know, those screen caps that were always going around of like, here's what we asked for. Here's the yeah. like, current horrors that we're living in. Here was our totally reasonable offer. And then they just said like, ah, no, you know, then I, th I think that really people were like, wait a minute, they like, this is how people have been living this whole time. Like, it, I think people were really shocked. And I think in fandom, you know, I think people, Star Trek fans in particular, like there's such a blurring of the lines between like you really, you know, there's because there's conventions and and like people really feel like they know these actors, they know these writers, they're invested in their lives. You know, they know the names of the writers who wrote their favorite episodes. And and so I think it it allowed it to be personalized in a way where it's like, this isn't some faceless, like the industry, this is real people going like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my electric bill because, yeah. you know, or, or like a shift in how Star Trek was made when Deep Space Nine was on and what residuals and payments and kind of like what the, the world looked like then versus how it is now. You can be like, oh, that's a really easy 
comparison for somebody's like non industry brain to understand what the writers who made the Star Trek you grew up on were like the houses they were able to buy for yeah. and the actors too, you know, versus what it is now. So I, I thought that was, it was really exciting just to sort of see people be like, you know, I want to help. I want there to be something like concrete and material that I can do. And I don't know what it is because like I live in Colorado or in Switzerland and how could other than tweeting, you know, what can we do? And I thought that was, it was really exciting to sort of find ways to deliver material support and really to just let people know, you know, when they came to the picket lines, like real human beings out there have your back. I think even if it did nothing except to sort of remind people who were picketing that public opinion was broadly on their side, you know, I think that psychologically and emotionally, I think is really meaningful. So yeah, it was really, it was very profound and transformative for me. I, had a wonderful time. Yeah. And and touching on a few things that you mentioned, I played a small part in organizing the Star Trek picket out here in New York. Yes. I saw pictures of that. (laughs) Yeah. And I got to meet, uh, I hope I'm saying their name, Celia Rose Gidding. That's one of those where I hope I'm saying it the correct way. But I was so starstricken because it was like, that's, you know, that's Uhura right here. That's Uhura. Oh my God. And they're so incredibly talented. Yes. Yes. And Celia was telling me about how residuals work for actors in the streaming era. And it's kind of basically that, you know, the the streaming service gives the actors an estimate of what they think the show will do. And so it's kind of structured against that. And I was like, wow, there is something kind of Star Trekian about what we're (laughs) we're fighting for. This this like uh, algorithm from space is coming out and reorganizing everybody's lives. Yeah, I mean, how many Star Trek episodes are about some kind of, you know, an AI or a computer technology that was developed a long time ago, specific to some circumstances and can't evolve or take in new information. And everybody now is suffering as opposed to being able to like have human beings like with their human capacity, make these choices. Yeah. That's my, that's my one regret is that we didn't, we didn't have the infrastructure until so late in the game to be doing any support for the East Coast pickets. And I now like, oh, I wish we had. Because that would have been so cool. <laughs> it really would. We had buttons and everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I want to talk more about your fandom. But but first, I want to dive into who you are specifically, Claire, because you are a playwright. You are a published author. I, These are yes. correct things. These are okay. correct things. Yes, I, <laughs> <are> correct things. <laughs> I have lots of things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you and and you are uh, you are queer and you are Catholic. Uh, am I missing anything else? Uh, <laughs> those are. I mean, those are kind those are of the, the, the big building blocks. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> combine those, shuffle those things up, and deal them out, and that's most of what my life looks like. <laughs> Now, being queer and Catholic sounds like there's a constant tug and pull combining those two things. Yeah, it's it is certainly that is certainly true. I <laughs> it it has been it's interesting. Like like it is kind of had a lot of peaks and valleys in my life. You know, I, I came out when I was in college, and I think it was like eight years before I drummed up the nerve to tell my Catholic family for a long time. You know, when I was, when I was very young and kind of new in my queer identity, I I just was like, lived like two different people, you know, like I was one person on campus with my friends, with the folks that I, you know, was, was out to. And then I would come home and sort of like put on my, you know, because my family was like, they're, they're not like, intensely fanatically Catholic in like a creepy conservative way, but they are people for whom like my mom's side of the family in particular, Catholicism is like baked into every single thing that you do. You know, everybody has like a rosary collection and like Renaissance Madonna paintings hanging in the front (laughs) hallway. And like, you know, everyone is named after saints. Like it's all, it's just like, it's in the DNA. And, and so I was very concerned about how they would take it. And, and they, it turned out it was, as these things so often are, it was like comically anticlimactic. Everyone was <laughs> terribly chill. They're super supportive. Um, my sister is also queer. You know, our family loves her wife. They love my girlfriend. Like it, you know, there, there was no, there was never any drama on that front, but I also where, where things um, erupted a bit and 
which I'm sure you'll be able to understand why it makes reading the news often very triggering, was I was also a youth minister at my church for 10 years. I ran the confirmation classes for high school kids. And at one point, um, I had participated in a, a queer Catholic documentary by a, a filmmaker named Brian Murphy, who hosts the Queer Theology podcast. This was like 2007 or something. And we'd met at a queer Catholic or queer, queer Christian conference. And he'd interviewed me and a friend of mine. And a clip of it ended up on YouTube. And then a fanatical right-wing Catholic blogger, crazy person found it and started like spamming the church with emails, trying to basically get them to fire me because it was I was a danger to children was sort of the implication. Wow. Yeah. And so that, you know, that's a that's a conversation we are suddenly and frustratingly having again about queer people being in spaces where there are children and and the idea that rather than it being affirming and important and validating and wonderful for Mm -hmm. kids to have role models of all kinds, that there's sort of an inherent sketchiness to it, which was really toxic. But that's also something in a way, I think that push pull like, I think it has shaped a lot of my writing, even in work that isn't explicitly centering queer characters or about queer stories, because I think in some ways I'm always a little bit exploring a sort of in, in a resistance to being told that two separate things that you are can't be compatible, you know, like that you have this identity and then you have this identity and people on both sides are telling you like, you can only be one thing or the other without allowing for the sort of mess and nuance and humanity of the fact that like everyone is many different things. The church I go to now is very progressive. It's sort of the one openly queer affirming Catholic church still left in Portland, we have an extremely homophobic archbishop who's sort of going around knocking everything down. Wait, one really? One. The, did you tell me the archbishop of Portland is yeah. uh, <laughs> is, is is awful? And I will happily say, you, you would, think that would be the coolest archbishop? Well, so here's here's how it happened. So we got the very last Benedict appointee because our previous guy, who was uh-huh. amazing. Yeah. Um, when you turn 75, you have to step down. And we were like, I think three months off in the timing from getting like it was it was right when um, before Benedict stepped down and Francis was elected. So if our previous guy had turned 75, like three months later, we would have gotten a cool Pope Francis bishop. <laughs> but we got but we got a guy who basically was sent here to be like the orthodoxy cop because the perception yeah. was that Portland was like super liberal and you know full of gay heathens and <laughs> and they so he picked he deliberately picked a guy who was he was from I think he came from like Kalamazoo, Michigan. Like he he came he he's not from here at all. He was mm. plucked from a place where he was a bishop, promoted to archbishop when he was sent to Portland, and he's pretty young. I think he's not 70 yet. So we're stuck with him for a good long time. And Pope Francis wow. of course is smart enough not to promote him because like we can't get rid of him until he unless he like got made a cardinal, but then like the cardinals get to vote on who's pope. And so like I don't really want him doing that either. Um yeah. I sort of want him to just fall down a well and never come out, but <laughs> But in the meantime, you know, we're stuck with him. And last year he published this horrific new set of guidelines that basically would like ban school Catholic schools from acknowledging, you know, the lived experience of trans and non-binary kids. Like you can't use their pronouns. You can't change names and policing things that have never been policed before, like how short girls can cut their hair or like a girl wow. named Margaret who goes by Max, which like, there was one when I was in grade school, you know, like things that like 30 years ago were not controversial. They'd be just like, she's a tomboy, who cares? You know, and now all of a sudden they're like toxic and whatever. So it's a weird time to be a queer Catholic in Portland right now, because like in the little bubble of my church and my family, I feel like extremely affirmed and validated and loved and supported. And then you set like one foot outside <laughs> that bubble and it's just like oh everybody hates me <laughs> wow. so well that's a great uh, opening line to a novel it's a weird time to be a queer catholic in portland <laughs> nothing will get me to turn the page pages of a book quicker than an opening line like that and uh the more that you're talking about catholicism i'm realizing how much i don't know and how it kind of parallels with 
fandom of certain franchises in a oh, way very in much that so. I yeah, want yeah. to fall down the rabbit holes and learn what a confirmation is. I want to learn <laughs> why, you know, when this 75 year rule came in, it, it, it like, there's like, it, it reminds you me of the same lower. feeling I get. Yeah. When I want to like go on a, like on a binge on Wikipedia. And so, you know, I have this, I, I've said this uh, a few other times, but as someone who grew up uh, Protestant, I always had a little bit of jealousy, black Protestant, you know, mm -hmm. uh, about Catholicism in the sense that it feels like you go to a Catholic church and you have all the rules and that you just kind of you can kind of do it in, in an emotionless way. Mm -hmm. I imagine from the outside, mm -hmm. whereas some Protestant churches, you really have to put your emotions on display and really kind of act it out in a way. And I always kind of resisted that. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it very much so. I, I There is something. So like one, one example is like when Catholics say grace before meals, it is a rote prayer that everybody knows. And you just say it like a robot. You, it's, <laughs> bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. And every Catholic, like every you know, whatever age, ge generation, demographic, whatever, like that is, that's what Catholic grace sounds like. And the yeah. first time I ever, because a lot of the like youth ministry folks that I worked with when I was doing that sort of belonged to a very evangelical flavored form mm. of conservative Catholicism and had a lot more of what I considered to be very Protestant practices. And the first time I was ever like, sitting in a restaurant having lunch with somebody for a work meeting and he was like let's say grace and i was like okay and he was just like dear heavenly father and i was like oh jesus Christ, what is happening yeah, yeah. Like, thank you so much for bestowing upon us the gift of your grace and i was just like i like catholics find that so gauche like there's something yeah. really like like you said like it is you know i mean even at my old church like even getting anybody to sing Oh, was yeah. like pulling teeth like you know there were there are like you know you sort of move your mouth along with like the hymns and stuff and some people will sing very loudly but like we tried sometimes like with the there was like, a, a youth mass that was like the youth ministry program added a sunday evening mass for the um for the kids and teens and my dad and i sang in the band for that and they would try to do things like um this is very you know protestant coded but like songs that had hand <laughs> gestures songs that had uh -huh. clapping and and then also trying to train people out of white people clapping you know oh yes um, yes but but songs are required you to be like physically engaged in some way and people just look at us like we're like what the f are you doing in our church like what are you what what energy have you brought in here you're trying to get me to like do things with my hand like it was just so antithetical to the to the catholicism that we were all raised in where you just sort of like sit sedately in the row with your 14 brothers and sisters and everybody just like politely you know says the right things and then you go home and so i think I feel like it is actually really interesting thinking about like how, how easy it is to sort of like clock out emotionally and, but also like what's sort of the happy medium between like, I do want to actually be engaged and like, I want to, mm -hmm. I want to have songs I want to sing along to. I want to be able to like, listen to, you know, to the sermon, but then, yeah. But then like, what's too far where you're just like, this feels like audience participation, community theater. And I'm really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> And it's funny, you know, talking about this as well, it's making me, you know, I've had this vision pop up during this conversation of, we all think about space exploration, you think a lot about space exploration. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I get a little freaked out thinking about uh, the export of religion as we uh, expand into the <laughs> into the stars. <laughs> and the vibe of, uh, you know, the, uh, the spread of uh, the the Catholic flavor of mm -hmm. Christianity. I can see exactly how this will expand to other planets. Where <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> a part of that is is baked into how it works. You know, mm -hmm. you kind of take uh, religious figures and you kind of you know transmogify them into saints or something. Yeah. You know, you kind of put a cross on top of some other things, and mm -hmm. uh, you figure out this. There is a melting pot. A strange, uh, organized melting pot nature to Catholicism, but it is the uh, the evangelicals that I worry about the most in outer space. That, oh, that, yeah. that there's something a lot more uh, nefarious yeah. in a strange way. Well.
I think, you know, the, the Jesuits who, who are, you know, have obviously a very dark history in the Catholic Church as missionaries are also, in, interestingly, like, deeply interwoven into the history of, of the sciences, particularly astronomy and astrophysics. Um, and that's hmm. something I always thought was really interesting, too. You know, like, I wonder, like, you know, at, at what point did, you know, like, did religious scientists begin to think about, like, you know, is there life on another planet? Like, is that next on our list of, like, places to go, Colin? <laughs> is it, like, were they this question in the 1700s, you know? Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And it's a totally different take on religion once it becomes, you know, there is this guy on Earth who did this thing. <laughs> right, yeah. Then it's like, wh- why does Vulcan care, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we got our own guy. Like, well, I feel like we could uh, hypothesize about science fiction for uh, a, an entire season of a different podcast. <laughs> but uh, to dive back into the themes of this one, yes. I'm curious to know. Of course, I have an assumption based on the bulk of this conversation. But but what was the first genre that called out to you when you were a kid? So I, I mean, I definitely like Star Trek is for sure one that I want to sort of loop back to, but I, I think I, you know, I was thinking about like, what's the earliest, like the youngest that I was that I remember being really yanked into something that hooked into my imagination. And it was sort of two different things. Um, One is, so my, um, our dad read to us every night when we were kids. And like, I have, I have a sister who's a year older than me and a brother who's three years younger. And and we, he read to, you know, all of us sort of together. And, and I remember sort of the sequence going from, as we were sort of, you know, like increasingly complex chapter book. So we started with Alice in Wonderland and then we did Narnia and then we did the Hobbit. And then from the Hobbit, of course, into the whole of the Lord of the Rings. And then once you sort of maxed out Lord of the Rings with your like, you know, six and seven year old kids, um, (laughs) <laughs> then he started reading us books that he liked, and that was how we sort of we had hopped from Tolkien into Terry Brooks, and he read us the Sword of Shannara, and and the oh my goodness, I forgot about that series. So this that was my <laughs> formative fantasy world. You know, like some people's it is Tolkien, some people huh. it is so you know like whatever is the kind of the the books the size of a phone book that you first fell in love with when you first <laughs> were old enough to be able to really disappear into a book that big. Terry Brooks was mine. And and you know and the and the sort of Shinar, the first one in the series, he was a young writer. It's very much Tolkien fanfic. You know, it's very much like yes. Middle Earth, but so it is in many ways like I think it's important to read as like it was the foundation of what is now this incredible landscape that encompasses, you know, seven or eight different series and standalone books that are all kind of networked together. So as a kind of origin point, you know, I think it's, I think it's artistically important, but I really got hooked into, so there's like, that was a trilogy. There's a sort of Shannara, the Elf Stones of Shannara, the Wish Song of Shannara. I forget what order those two go in. And then, so that's kind of the original books. And then when I was, I think in maybe like fourth grade, I started just, I was like reading them all on my own. My dad would like loan me the books that when he finished them. And there was a series that was set like several hundred years after that, after the sort of Shannara story. And it's about a a much kind of politically darker and more oppressive world. Like the world has changed and these stories have sort of been relegated now into ancient myths. Like nobody Mm. now anymore even believes the sort of Shannara really existed, you know, that kind of thing. That's really Um, cool. (laughs) <laughs> and it follows the descendants of like people who are sort of in the lineage of those primary characters are tasked with by the the ghost of the wizard Alanon, who's like the Gandalf of the first three books. He's like the wizard that kind of gives everybody their assignments and he yeah. dies. But his ghost basically tasks kind of the heirs of all of these characters that were hugely significant in those first three books to go find these four talismans that will sort of bring magic back to the world. And that one was the one that really hooked me when I was like, you know, elementary school, because the, 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 the one girl character, you know, of course, like the, it was like a kick-ass girl, the, the, like the cousin of the main characters. And her job was to like find the missing elves and bring the elves back to the world to like restore the balance of magic. And so what you learn over the course of these, you know, a million different 
books, this whole universe that Terry Brooks built is what starts off as basically like a Middle Earth ripoff, but like, you know, trolls and gnomes and <laughs> and elves and all of the tropes you expect from kind of Germanic folklore flavored history. What it actually, what you learn eventually, this is, I guess this is kind of a spoiler, but um, <laughs> that it's all actually far distant future post-apocalyptic and like there was a battle between basically magic and science and magic oh, one wow. and his books like so he has a series that's set in like modern times as magic begins to sort of seep into the world and then there's another series that's about like magic and the real world coexisting and like a guy just like a like a software programmer who gets like pulled through a portal into the magic world and then and then you'll then the book set in the Shannara kingdom, like, you know, somebody will, will uncover a city from a lost civilization and they're describing in their own words and language, what they see. And you're like, Oh, that's like a modern street. You know, it's talking about like, yeah. like the, the streets are all like too gray and straight and the buildings are all square boxy. And you're like, Oh, this is like a, a post-apocalyptic, you know, landscape. And then, so basically it's all like, you think it's happening in middle earth and it turns out it's all Seattle. Like it's all like, <laughs> like the Pacific Northwest thousands of years from now after magic has overtaken yeah. it. And there's little sort of, and so just like the world building is so incredible. Um, and I, I reread, so like this, this, um, the talismans of Shannara, uh, collection, I bought like a compendium. It was like the something 30th or something anniversary. And they'd like re-release them all in like one giant hardbound. And I brought it to the beach with me. We go to the fourth of, to the beach for 4th of July every year. And like, it's, you know, will it giant book week? Everyone brings like whatever <laughs> huge tome they're currently immersed in. And that was mine. And they like fully held up. But I remember just as a little kid, the shift from chapter books for children that our dad was reading us that were like, you know, like increasing levels of complexity, but still very much books that are like for children that children love that really shape children's imaginations written mm. with the idea that kids would be reading these things into just like, you know, into books that were very clearly written for adults, sort of the, the, the step up in, complexity that you get going from A to B really like blew my little Catholic school <laughs> mind. You know, there's, there's the amount of, you know, sex and violence and things like that, but also just like political complexity and how you build a society and, you know, corruption in government and all of these just like big themes that like you don't really get in kids literature. And when I was younger, like, so my, my parents, like we were not allowed to watch TV on school nights. So which meant that like, you know, on weekends, my sister and I would just go feral and watch like anything that was on like Jerry Springer. <laughs> we didn't even care just to get it in our eyeballs, you know, yeah. but, um, but our, our reading, I, I don't remember our reading ever being monitored or policed. Like I don't ever mm. remember there being a rule about like what you could or couldn't check out from the library or how much time you could spend reading, you know, for pleasure on your own, like n none of that. And so we all, so everyone in my family, like we all became readers, but I, I, because, because I have, I have ADHD. And so, and I have it in a way that really manifests as like hyper fixations. And so if I'm in a book where I'm like deep in it, you know, I'm like reading for like hours and hours and hours, like yeah. it, the, the world around me, like completely stops feeling real. Like you could, you could try to get my attention for an hour and I will not hear you. Like that's, yeah. I, I'm in this world, you know, and, and the Shannara <laughs> books for me were really the first kind of a hook into things I was reading for pleasure where I just opened the pages and completely disappeared. And, and they were, yeah, they were full of like, you know, kick-ass girls who shot bows and arrows. And there's like a, you know, like the main, the main girl in the books that I like, she has a friend who like flies on a giant bird. Like that's how they get to this remote Island <laughs> is she's like flying on the back of this like huge Eagle. And I was like, Oh my God, I would do that. You know? And, um, <laughs> and, and just like, just the richness of of that. I think I I got really hooked on on fantasy just because I think in science fiction too, just sort of feeling like you want an escape from the ordinariness of your life. And I also do wonder if somehow that's kind of endemic to Catholicism. You know, it's a big story, it's lots of drama, lots yeah. of pageantry. You know, that was sort of the world that I grew up in, and the stories that I was really drawn to. I think had that you know 
magic and pomp and circumstance and mystery and scope. And so I think, so the Shannara books really, I think hooked me as a reader and very much shaped, particularly as I was sort of beginning to write the early things that I wrote. And then the other sort of connected thematically piece of that, which was actually when I was much, much younger before I was able to, you know, read a huge 800 page book on my own was my mother. (laughs) My mother was obsessed with this band from the seventies. I'm not, I don't know. Are you familiar (laughs) with, Steel Eye Span. Steel Eye Span? Steel Eye, like the salmon. Steel Ah, Eye Span, S-P-A-N. They are, they're so so weird and I love them so much. It's like, it was a British (laughs) folk rock band from the 70s. and, Uh And they would do like, you know, like 1970s, like electric guitar, but it was versions of like old English folk ballads, you know, like, Thomas the Rhymer and Tam Lin oh, wow. and Robin Hood and fairy queens and, <laughs> you know, a guy rides over the moor and kidnaps the woman he's in love with and the husband chases after him and, <laughs> uh, or like, you know, something has gone terribly wrong at a medieval fair or like, I mean, just like, <laughs> like, and, and there was, they're all very highly, I mean, just, you listen to them now and you're like, yes, that is, that is the seventies. Like they are, <laughs> they, they don't sound, you know, it's not like an Enya situation. Like it doesn't okay. have a sort of yes, ethereal. Real Zeppelin. magical, yeah. Um, but the main, <laughs> the lead singer was is a woman named Maddie Pryor. I believe is still alive. She looks in person. My sister and I saw her in concert. She looks exactly like you would imagine the best forest witch in the world to look. She has a kind of <laughs> Stevie Nicks fashion aesthetic. You know, everything is sort of flowing scarves and like long oh. skirts. But she has this voice, like she it's no there's no vibrato. And it is so like piercing and otherworldly. Like I've never nobody in the world sings quite like like you would never mistake her voice for anybody else. And then there's a whole band of, you know, they play all different kinds of instruments, and some of them are like older period instruments and sometimes it's just like you know wailing on an electric guitar um and a bunch of other voices another woman and a couple of men who all sing and they're all you know wonderful but this was like my mom's favorite band when she was in college and so when we were and and as an adult or or I, i think even as older like teenager i came to learn that a large number of their songs were extremely not appropriate for children Uh, (laughs) but the album that we listened to the most when i was very little and my mom used to tell me that this was the first song that i ever like learned to sing that i would like sort of sing and dance you know all around the house um it's called all around my hat and it's ostensibly a ballad about like I thought when I was a kid, what it was about was like, it's like a woman who wears greenery around her hat, like for decoration. And it turns out that it's a whole sort of metaphor for like infidelity. And her husband has gone away to sea and she's pretty sure that he's cheating on her. But I had no idea. I was just like, I'm just like, <laughs> these are like all around my hat, just dancing around the living room. But the album, like the record that that song was on, there was like, yeah, there was like a song about Robin Hood. And there was a song about a guy who was kidnapped by like a fairy princess fell in love with him and tried to, and basically like magically lured him away from the woman that he was going to marry and like trapped his soul forever. And there was one that sort of sounded like an old, like, like a, uh, acapella drinking song that a bunch of like guys in some, you know, Henry the eighth hunting lodge would all sing. And, and mm. it was, you know, I think it it definitely did, I think, elicit a a lifelong fixation that all the women in my family have with like anything English or Scottish or Irish, particularly, you know, folklore and music and things like that. But it was it was sort of similar to, you know, I think the same hook as the Shannara books. It was like these little peaks into stories that had all of these like layers of magic entering the real world, right? Like it's just a guy walking down the street and a woman, you know, crosses his path and says hi to him. And next thing he knows, he's like ensorcelled and the fairy queen (laughs) sex slave. Like just like things like that just (laughs) happened back then, you know? And so it was, you know, again, it was like, it, it was sort of this intersection between reality and mystery and all of this sort of, you know, everything could kind of have anything that happened to you could be sort of, you know, the signifier that something interesting and magical was about to happen. And I think that, you know, if you are a like 
little upper middle class white girl in Portland, Oregon with a extremely like normal and stable and functional <laughs> home and nothing interesting like ever happens to you. You know, I think I I really wanted to feel like big, interesting things were happening to me. Like I wanted I, to be in worlds where big yeah. things were happening. You know, I didn't want to I totally that connect with that. Me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You uh, were a sci-fi kid, right? Yeah, sci-fi kid. Uh, but I also fantasy. I, I loved The Lord of the Rings. I got yeah, into yeah. it because of the movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and briefly, um, you know, I think one of my dad's friends got me the Sword of Shannara book. And I, mm-hmm. I so when you mentioned that, I was like, I forgot about that. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't dive further in. But um, that feeling of, almost did, did it feel kind of absurd to you that you had a pretty stable upbringing that for me when when i reached my teen years i felt like an outcast because i didn't have any pers- much personal you know chaos comparatively to speak of compared to some of my friends who whose families are going through divorces and all kinds of stuff yeah you really it i always sort of felt like i th- i think i had this very very sort of self-aggrandizing childhood notion of like that my life was too small for me in some way, you know, Uh like, like I, I'm, I'm destined to do like bigger and greater things than this like normal person life. And now, you know, now I look back and you're just like, Oh, sweetie, you know, but I I think, (laughs) I think, you know, when you're a kid and you, yeah, I think very much like you said, like when you sort of see, you know, other people's, like, if you're looking at everyone's lives as a story, which I always very much did, I think I always sort of had a writer brain, you know, then you're just kind of like, okay, so like the plot in mine, I guess, just has not kicked off yet. You know, everybody else has like- (laughs) You're waiting for your hero's journey to begin. Right, exactly. You're just like, where is the magician that will come along and set me on my path? (laughs) My parents aren't even interestingly divorced, you know? And, um, and, And then I think then, you know, the the ironic thing about that was that, you know, the stories that were sort of escapism for me in a comforting way when I was sort of imagining myself being the girl sent to like bring the elves back to the world, you know, with my Mm. bow and arrow and my trusty eagle familiar, you know, (laughs) like I, when, like when big things did start to happen in my life, you know, when, when my, when my mother was dying, then it was like, they were comforting for me in a different way because I needed that escapism into a world. And I think this is, this is a core thing for me in both my fantasy and sci-fi An escape into a world where eventually everything turns out all right. Like that you, Mm. that you can go through, like, I can't do the nihilism stuff. I, I am, I am willing to put up with, you know, a lot of hard slog through, suffering and pain and, you know, people die and you lose people. And sometimes you try and you fail. And sometimes, you know, you, you think that this is going to be the one that, you know, that really clicks and then it's not, and you have setbacks and along the way and all of that stuff is just good storytelling. But I need to go into it knowing that, you know, at the end, after the dust settles, that Mm. a, a small group of people coming together because they believe in something bigger than themselves will eventually like that they will fix the thing that is broken and and the world will be better for the next generation of people coming along. Like I need to sort of feel like there is that resolution and like, like of which the Lord of the Rings is like a perfect example, you know? Yeah. And that, that was also very much, I think my, my hook into Star Trek, cause I was a kid in the eighties. So I grew up when the next generation was on and that was sort of my initial, I didn't actually, I did not come to, Kirk and Spock and the original series until my forties, like until really like within the last three years, probably. And I got into it because I liked strange new world so much. I was like, I should return to the source text and like (laughs) see what's going on with this Spock guy, you know? Um, But, uh, but the next generation is such a like engineered for comfort. You know, it, it Mm. was like deep space nine was probably more formative to me as like, a writer as a science fiction fan as sort of shaping my teenage thinking about, because, you know, it's a frontier politics show set in space. It's about like the moral compromises of like collaborating with an interim government after occupation. Like it will sort of never not be politically relevant, but the next generation is just like, this, you know, luxury spacecraft where yeah, you're just the carpeted, flying along. The carpeted spacecraft. Carpeted, exactly. And it's just like, it's just <laughs> you and your friends and everyone's rooms are so nice and their off-duty <laughs> clothes are fabulous. And and they have an adventure and it is neatly resolved in 44 minutes. But the core, like, 
it is primarily about the people in their relationships more than it is, I think, centering the things that happen to them. And I think all of the Star Treks are like that too. Like the aliens of the week are cool and mm. the various adventures that they find on all of the strange new worlds that they explore are often, you know, that's like the tropes that we remember. We remember the Borg. We remember, um, you know, the tar pit that sucked up Tasha Yar. Like we, we remember the visuals of like the styrofoam rocks that Kirk and Spock were throwing. Like all of the sort of the alienness of the worlds they visit is often, you know, that sort of, those are what, what stick in our, in our mind. But I think what distinguishes Star Trek from just kind of any generic show that is set in space is that every ship and station has sort of fundamentally a similar makeup of these are people who, for whatever reason, did not fit easily in the world they came from, you know, and um, and maybe it's because it's somebody like Spock who is literally of two worlds and doesn't quite feel right in either one or Worf who is Klingon, but was raised on earth by humans and is always like trying to be Klingon enough, you know, or somebody like Odo who doesn't know anything about the planet he even came from until like much later in the show. Um, or, you know, people who like struggle to fit in and make friends because they're all just kind of weird goobers or they have, you know, they there's like people who are, it was all sort of, they're ones of the oddballs. And, yeah. and when you get little peeks into their backstory, you all sort of understand like, Oh, okay. This is like, you have a complicated relationship with your father or you joined Starfleet because you were from a tiny little backwoods town and you wanted to go have adventures or whatever. But like, there was some reason why, the life trajectory that was laid out for you wasn't a good fit. And so you sort of ran away to join the circus in a way. <laughs> and that's how you all ended up on this ship together. And that's where they find wholeness and belonging and friendship and love often and, and like purpose to their life. And that, that idea was so like the friendship and the communities that they build. I think that in so many ways was the hook as much as, you know, the cool space stuff. It was like, okay, it's cool space stuff, but also you have this like built in pack of best friends that you get yeah. to go have the space adventures <laughs> with, you know, and I was like kind of a lonely introvert kid for a long time. You know, like I was the fat girl in class and I was very bookish and it took me until, you know, college and adulthood to really feel like I sort of had a, like a really robust social network and community and so I think, you know, for kids in particular, especially like isolated, weirdo, nerdy kids, <laughs> that idea of having, you know, having that family that you've built yourself, which is also such a queer experience too. like queer found families are often like that. Like you don't, maybe you don't come from a family of origin that you'll ever mm. feel like you can fully be yourself. In. And so you have to kind of go out in the world and find all of the other misfits and build your own <laughs> little starship enterprise crew. And I always just thought that was really beautiful. And also that it, it was the same, like larger than life, you know, you're escaping from smallness. You're out there having these like grand adventures in a way that feels like safe, I think in a way that felt like comforting because they're like, Captain Picard's not really going to let anything bad happen to you. You know? And I yeah. think as a kid, that was like, I, I took like real comfort in that. Don't scroll away. You are the genre. We'll be right back after the break. Here we are in the middle of the show where I remind you that you are the genre is a listener supported podcast. I just do this for the love of great conversation and bringing those conversations to you. And if you'd like to support the show in any way, there are two ways you can do it. You can do it by simply subscribing to the newsletter associated to the podcast. You can find a link to that in your show notes or at you are the genre.com. You can just subscribe for free or you can upgrade to a paid subscription, which gives you advanced episodes and so much more. You know, the paid subscription is a nice way to say, hey, I financially appreciate what you're doing. And all artists appreciate that. I also use this break in the middle of the show to talk about something that I've simply been enjoying. And something I've started diving into again is my love of Ray Bradbury. And I feel like that connects to, you know, the point of this show. Ray Bradbury, I've realized, is one of those first specific science fiction genres of storytelling that I fell in love with. And it's been exciting listening to his interviews again, reading some of his short stories again, and seeing as how this episode's coming out in October. One of my favorite short stories of Ray Bradbury is one titled Skeleton. 
It freaked me out when I first read it, and it freaks me out now. But you know what's not freaking me out? This great comedy album from Tim Platt titled Teeth Like Beak. Tim is joining me in next week's episode, and if you are a paid subscriber, you can listen to that right now. So there you go. Subscribe to the newsletter, get freaked out about Skeleton by Ray Bradbury, and listen to Teeth Like Beak by Tim Platt. And if you're interested in subscribing to the newsletter, get all of the information you need at youarethegenre.com. Now, back to the episode. Where were we? And it's so perfect that uh, Patrick Stewart played both Picard and Charles Xavier, another leader yeah. of a, a group of misfits. Exactly. And, and so to dive into the second question of the yeah. show, uh, the second question is, what's the first craft that you pursued? But I guess another way to phrase it is, what's the first circus that you tried to run off to and join? <laughs> I mean, I I was always I was always a writer. I mean, I I wrote poetry when I was a very little kid. I I have I have a whole whole shelf of journals and you know terrible teenage poetry and short stories and things. But it was all I think it was it was initially it was very much shaped by you know by those three things. I was trying to write poetry that felt like Steel Eye Span songs. I was trying to write <laughs> fantasy stories that felt like Shannara. I was trying to uh. write science fiction that like the things that made me feel like the way the things that I love, you know, made me feel. And I and I had very little interest in you know, in stories about anybody who was like me at all. You know, it was like I want to oh, yes. I want to mentally project myself into this sort of heroine of this fairy tale or whatever, you know, that I'm writing. And I think the first, um, the first like attempt at a novel I ever wrote. And I I can't believe, I don't think I've ever told anybody about this before because it was (laughs) deeply embarrassing, but I, I, like, I think I might have absorbed through osmosis without understanding or without necessarily connecting it. But this was sort of around the time that my mom and my aunt were very into the Outlander books, which involve okay. uh, a woman from like a nurse from World War II who gets sort of pulled through this magical portal into 17th century Scotland. And they're actually there. They, they get a lot of play as like, you know, for being super famous, like romantic books, which they also are. But actually, the time travel lore is my favorite part. But anyway, um, <laughs> but I, I had sort of. Like reading back now, I'm just like, oh, I think this is was sort of infused by that. But it was like a lady in <laughs> this is so embarrassing. It, okay, it was like a woman who was like a housewife during like the depression. And she was oh. married to this, she lived in like some like dust bowl town, right? And she and she had like and she had like a son. And she was uh-huh. married to this like abusive alcoholic monster guy and like couldn't get away from him you know and like the whole world was like gray and bleak and then and then it turned out that like she was like the prophesied true love of this like fairy prince guy and like all her life he'd been like he had like a magic mirror that was like showing him his true love and so he'd been like Mm -hmm. watching her and then there was like at some point something happened i forget what the plot was as such as it was um that like something happened where like the veil between the worlds was thinner and he was able to like come over to like just like step across her wall and like rescue her and her son and like bring them back to the fairyland. But then it turned out that like the evil alcoholic husband like also had magical powers somehow. And so like uh. <laughs> he came to get her back. This is a very, well, so what age were you when you're writing this? This is, there's, there's a lot more than my, uh, you know, high school attempts at writing. Uh, I, I think I, I think I started it. I probably started it when I was like 12. Um, <laughs> but I, but it, but it, I like, I kind of kept chipping away at it. And the, the, the funniest part about it, I mean, this is the reason, and why it's like I won't even throw the notebook away because I'm so terrified of like the garbage man finding it so like it's still here <laughs> like locked in a box um <laughs> But like as I got older, the story got much hornier. It was just sort of oh, like, wow, yeah. like you're also kind of working out all of the things that you're sort of like learning about like bodies and sexuality. But I remember there being like I I think probably in its most direct roots, it was like labyrinth fan fiction because you know like like an ordinary girl who gets sort of pulled into this magical land and then like i remember there was like there was a ball and there was all of this stuff with like 
the woman learning that she had magical powers now that like she was in this land and like all of the different like kinds of magic that the people at court did. And of course everyone was jealous of her because she was so beautiful and she had red hair because I wanted red hair. You know, it was very, (laughs) it was very like self insert fan fiction, you know? Yeah. So that was like the first, and I, I never, I certainly never finished it. And then, uh, and then I remember, I think I was maybe, I think I maybe was in high school the very first time I tried to write a play and it was, it was an adaptation of one of my favorite deeply messed up and unhinged Grimm's fairy tales, which is the goose girl. I'm not familiar with the goose girl. It's a, it's kind of a, it's a real, it's a B side. Definitely. Um, (laughs) I, I think it was like in a compendium, of grim stories that I had when I was a kid. Like I remember I mean, my mama had like the big book of like all of them, but I feel like the goose girl was in like another, you know, uh, which, and again, <laughs> these are not for children at all, but you know, I was Catholic. I had a kid's book of the saints when I was like in second grade. That was just like, it's oh. all just medieval torture devices, you know, <laughs> like the things that you learn about your name saint and, how horribly they died are also not necessarily child appropriate. Wow. This is a big difference yeah. between Catholic and Protestant kids. It's like, how old <laughs> did you learn what a Catherine wheel does? But so the, so the goose girl, it involves a, a magical talking horse. And the, so the big, the, the, like the plot of it is there's like a princess or like a, I think she's a princess um, and her maid servant. And the princess is basically sent across the kingdom to this other kingdom to marry this prince. Um, and along the way, the maidservant is basically like, actually, I'm going to just like single white female you and steal your life. And she does something. She basically like forces sort of a knife point, forces mm-hmm. the princess to pretend to be the maidservant and that she will marry this guy. And the only witness is the talking horse who of course, like nobody believes because it's a horse. And, and so they get to the city and she like marries the prince and the prince kind of has a like, Oh, I was told that my future wife was like a nice girl. And this one is like kind of a obnoxious harpy and is really mean to her (laughs) maidservant. Um, He ends up falling in love with the maidservant, but she, she like the, um, the lady in waiting who's disguised as a princess tries to give her basically like, what's the servant job that will keep you like the farthest away from the castle where nobody will talk to you and have a chance to like bust my plans. So she ends up being essentially sent out to the marshes to take care of the King's geese, which is where Mm -hmm. the name of the story comes from. And so, you know, of course, by the end of it, it all works out. Okay. Because the prince finds the real princess and they fall in love. And then the talking horse who the lady in waiting murdered to keep him from basically like ratting her out, like, comes back to life, I think. And then, and then of course the maid servant is like horribly punished for, she like, I think, I think in this one, it was like, they put her in a barrel and they, and they like hammer nails into the barrel and then roll mm. her downhill. Like that was, that was the Grimm's brothers sort of solution for that one. Um, very dark, but I, and I can't remember now, you know, of course saying that a lot, I'm just like, why did I write a play about this? But I think I was just really fascinated by the fact that, Unlike a lot of fairy tales in general, but grim fairy tales in particular, the primary relationship was between the women, which was also why I liked Bluebeard, because Mm. Bluebeard is one where, you know, an evil guy, actually, I wrote a play about this, too, when I was in college, an evil guy, you know, marries, he's marrying these women and killing them, but the woman... Bluebeard's wife who ends up being rescued and, you know, Bluebeard eventually is defeated. The rescuer is her sister. And so I think, I think because I had a sister and because maybe even before I sort of could articulate the fact that I was queer, I sort of knew that like stories that were just like a guy and a girl fall in love was sort of like, that's less interesting to me, you know? Mm. And so the ones that were like, in villain hero relationship, but it's between women as opposed to between like a good guy and a bad guy, like was very interesting to me or like, you know, a sister saving a sister as opposed to like a man saving the woman he loves, you know, like I, things mm-hmm. like that, I, I, I think sort of hooked me into a lot of fairy tale stuff. But, um, but yeah. And then I got, when I was in college, I studied theater. I went to college thinking that I wanted to be an actor and and what I learned quite quickly was that it is difficult to be an actor if you are so 
controlling that you really <laughs> want to be in charge of the stage oh, picture yeah. for everybody. <laughs> I, was I like, felt that way when I briefly did improv, where it was yeah, like, that's where what you're I realized. Like, you want to be able to fix everybody else's stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, I, it was just like, I want the the strengths and weaknesses to be all my fault basically mm, mm-hmm, kind of- <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah exactly yeah you're just like i want i want to just like rise and fall based on how good i am on the day yeah yeah <laughs> well and i i you know for me the interesting thing too and this is why i i for me where i sort of was like okay the acting is not my craft is i i have a very difficult time and i i sometimes don't understand how other people could do it just sort of like instantly channeling emotions like I I Mm. can I can process them as I'm writing like you know my my writing can be very emotionally honest if it's sort of fictional and then you have a little bit of a a little bit of cover you know um but when you're acting and it's like physically you up there like I remember every acting class I ever took where somebody was trying to teach you how to cry on stage and they would say things (laughs) like you know okay like imagine imagine your parents dying and I'm like okay like I I I am Forming that picture in my head per <laughs> your instructions, like what's next? Like wh- how do I yeah. how do I make that make me like I but because I know that it's fa- like it's just I couldn't I couldn't like hook an emotion to it where it would actually like you know like I, I think because it was like my brain knows this is fake. I'm just picturing this because you told me to. It's not like when you yeah. go see a movie or you see a play and you're sort of surprised by an emotion that's like drawn out of you. You're just like, well, I can't do that to myself. You know, so. Do you feel like that in some way circles back to what we were talking about, uh, you know, Catholicism versus uh, Protestants in terms of uh, yeah. how you engage? I actually, you know, I had never thought about it like that, but I, I think that's really true. I think, I think that they're on some level – when you're raised Catholic, there's sort of an expectation that emotional demonstrativeness is sort of something to be managed. You know, like it isn't, mm. you're you're not rewarded for, you know, like being slain in the spirit and speaking in tongues, you know, like for, for yeah. being <laughs> really deeply struck by a profound emotional experience in the moment that is like tied to religion. That's sort of considered like unseemly, you know. And my family mm. were very like, um, you know, my mother was like the chair of the board of Catholic charities and very like, you know, sort of like society lady, you know, like super involved in philanthropy. And, you know, it was, I grew up in a house where you'd be like downstairs in the basement doing your homework and she'd come down and be like, okay, kids, like everybody come up before cocktail hour is over. So you can say <laughs> hello to the archbishop and then go back and finish your homework. Like, that was just sort of, that was very much the world. And, and so I think my, my understanding of religion and 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 also I think of just what being a, a Catholic person meant had to do with like I'm composed of this sort of library of stories, right? This like I, I have this sort mm. of lore that I've inherited. So the saints that I'm named after and you know, thin things like that. And then there's like mm. there are behaviors that you do of which some are showing up at church and saying the right words, and some are <laughs> Are like how you live in the world. Like how how is what are Jesus's expectations for how you're supposed to treat immigrants and poor people, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, and just sort of the way that like that you sort of lived that out in the world. But but it was not. But you didn't like talk about. You didn't. You know. You didn't like. You didn't say like, oh, I'm involved in this you know particular thing because it like is meaningful. It was sort of like, this is just kind of, these are just, this is what we do, you know? And, yeah, yeah. and, and so maybe, I don't know, maybe part of why I was really drawn at such a young age to stories that had that kind of bigness to them was in some degree, like a craving to break out of that, maybe like that, I that I wanted to be in a world where things were bigger, including like <laughs> my capacity to express things bigger, you know, or to do yeah. bigger things. But, um, but I, but I do feel like there is, there is very much sort of a Catholic sensibility woven through, you know, a lot of the, certainly all of the things that I write, but also just a lot of the media that I really gravitated to when I was first sort of forming my aesthetic as a writer, I think. You, you mentioned how after the, the passing of your mother, you started to have this interest in stories and storytelling that does kind of have that, uh, that hopefulness at the end. Mm-hmm. And that made me think of, uh, 
of the latest Matrix movie, Matrix. Uh, oh yeah, I haven't seen that one yet, but I but I I have heard. <laughs> I I'm I'm very like I was sort of delighted that they like brought it back after all of that time and gave us like a happy ending. <laughs> yes, yes, gave us a happy ending, and and a part of the uh, what made them want to make that movie apparently. Uh, at least I, I don't know how much is true sometimes, you know, but but <laughs> but apparently was after uh, the passing of their parents, realizing that in some way Morpheus and uh, Neo and Trinity kind of represented them and wanting to mm. give them a sort of happy ending through this sense of mourning and, and kind of this getting to this place where your personal life kind of intersects with the things that you create. Yeah. And it feels like a lot of the, uh, like uh, uh, perhaps you, but a lot of the people that were talking about the author of the Sword of Shannara series, certainly J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, your personal life starts to become melded with this yeah. expansive universe that you've created and you can't help but wonder what things from their personal life they're kind of pouring into this and yeah. what element of, you know, your psyche Gandalf or Sauron or whatever <laughs> represents. Right. But it feels so, you know, we kind of put a lot of these these writers on a, on a pedestal because it is, you know, a rare thing when someone can do it to uh, on a certain caliber. But it also feels like this is a very human thing to be doing <laughs> to create yeah. these sort of like grand stories with connective tissue that can embody elements of you on a personal level, but can also connect with you know, let's say you're a tribe, let's say, you know, you find your found family and you write an X-Men like series. And clearly all of this <laughs> is connected to this, uh, these personal moments that you've mm -hmm. had with everyone. All that to say, if anything that I just said, that jumble of words sparks anything to no, from I, you, uh, please express it. I, <laughs> I think <laughs> exactly right. I, I think what, what I, what it makes me think of is, and I think this is something that's true of, of so much art, but it's also part of why I love science fiction and fantasy is I, as an artist, I think that it's the specific things that are the most universal. Like I, I remember reading um, a couple years ago, I, I, I finally read Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking, which is her memoir of the year of her life after her husband died. And there's a part where she talks about that she was going through his closet and, you know, she gave his clothes away, you know, donated them to Goodwill, his ties, his watches and everything. And for some reason, she could not let go of his shoes. It was it was like mm. some, some weird little part of her brain was like, but when he comes back, he won't. He, he won't be able to leave the house if he doesn't have shoes. Like that there was some yeah. tiny little fantasy part of her brain that was like. Getting rid of the shoes means he's really dead and was not oh, ready yeah, to take yeah. that step. And I and I remember being I, reading and thinking like I know exactly what this is because for me it was my mother's silver candlesticks. It was I used to be the one who would like she had ALS and so she lost the ability uh. to do things with her hands quite early. And so I would come over and like I would polish the silver for her because it would drive her crazy if it wasn't polished. And then and then sort of to help kind of keep her things looking the way she wanted to have them look. And then when she died and my brother was still living in the house and he would, you know, sort of moving things around. And I would just have this like visceral panic reaction to like anybody moving mm. the candlesticks because it was like, if they're not on that shelf exactly where she left them, then I have to admit that she's dead in a way that I like wasn't ready to do that, you know? And so yeah. I think, and I think those like really, drilling down into those super concrete emotional details. Like it's universal because like, yeah, I don't have a dead husband and it wasn't about shoes, but I also have my own version of a thing that is exactly like that and is exactly that specific. And I yeah. think part of what makes like, I think why something like the Lord of the Rings, for example, is so universal and, or why like the original Star Trek, for example, is so universal is that you'll have these moments that are deeply specific to the world building of that world that are also so emotionally universal that everybody can read it and relate to it, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so like, it might be space or dragons or these like larger than life, pieces of story, but the way the, you know, the individual characters behave and relate to them and, you know, what it represents or like the fears you have to overcome or, you know, like what it, like it, you know, I think 
I think the Lord of the Rings sort of normalizing this idea of like, it's okay to be like, I'm on this adventure really grudgingly. I would rather have <laughs> I liked my nice little house, god damn it. You know, like like that's such a relatable guy, you know. And yeah. um and and that then like the the happy ending is being able to return back to the life. And you come back change because that's sort of the arc of, you know, that's the, the hero's journey. But I think that's something that's a deeply emotional relatable kind of universal trope that everybody has some kind of a hook into. And I think that, you know, with, with bad fantasy and science fiction where it becomes about the dragons and the spaceships, Mm -hmm. then I lose interest, you know, then, then it's, and I think this is part of why, like, I had I had a hard time with Game of Thrones, partly because <laughs> it began to feel like it was about the deaths and the mm. shocks and the the kind of emotional jump scares of terrible things happening to these characters. And what I wanted it to be was like the adventures of the Stark children kind of scattering around this world, having their own adventures and then coming back again. And finally you're sort of like, well, okay, well that's not the book that I'm going to get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. That's not what this, that's not what we're doing here. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, this is, these are maybe not for me, but yeah, but, and I think, you know, like you, and you brought up X-Men, you know, before, and I think the X-Men is just a fascinating example of, you know, we, we keep reinventing it and remaking it because, it, I think it, you know, in some ways, like it scratches that the same itch that made Harry Potter so successful. That the the desire to find a place, like like a a school or a a teacher or a mentor who sort of sees the thing that makes you a freak everywhere else, and is like, no, actually, <laughs> you're that's what makes you unique and special, and cultivates that. And you know, and I think it's like you know, speaking of, you know, putting artists up on pedestals, I think that, you know, the, the most depressing thing about how nightmarishly horrific JK Rowling has become as a human (laughs) being is really, is when you really unpack what those books meant to queer and trans kids who grew up Mm. reading them and, and were identifying with sort of the idea of, of like, you know, a, a, a bunch of misfits kind of coming together to find a place yeah. where they belonged. It's like, that's like, like, Oh, okay. So, you know, you never actually meant that to apply to everybody. You didn't, you didn't want yeah, that yeah. to be universal the way other writers really want everybody to sort of feel at home in those stories. But um, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm certain that someone's written a think piece about this, but in the, in the aftermath of everything about uh, JK, I realized how, at the same time, through this is the first thing that I ever read where it's kind of saying witches and wizards do the exact same thing, but they're kind of gendered by the fact that one uh-huh. group is called wizards and the yeah. other group is called witches. Yeah. And <laughs> and and the fact it, it is I think something that's been really interesting about the sort of the downfall of of JK Rowling over just really going, you know, masks off monster on the internet <laughs> is, is that it actually has opened up space for people to kind of look back at those books and be like, Oh, actually a lot of, a lot of stuff was wrong with it. Apart from, you know, her sort of ideology about trans people, like actually like much of this was never okay. And I think that the gendered <laughs> is a piece of it. Um, you know, uh, many of my friends who are Jewish were like, oh, yeah, no, the Goblin Bank is yeah, yeah, really, yeah. really <laughs> bad. And I was like, oh, yeah. And we really did all. Like, everyone is kind of let that go by. Um, so it's just, you know, like the people who were trying to say, maybe this is problematic. We're sort of spitting into the wind against this absolute publishing juggernaut, where now yeah. I think there is some space to look back at that. But I find, I feel like, you know, magical school or like magical kids coming together under an adult mentor is such a eternally beloved kids literature trope because it plays into that universality. Like there's something about Mm. you that makes you not fit in in the world that you're from. But A, other people are like that. So you're not the only one. You're not alone. You're not a freak. You have like a community and you just need to find those people. And that'll sort of, that'll be your tribe. That'll be your community. Um, I Have you read... They're they're much younger. They're sort of like middle grade books. But do you have you read the Mysterious Benedict Society? No, I haven't. It's oh, they're so they're so lovely. They're they there was like a I think one season 
of a streaming show, maybe on Disney Plus, that was terrific, and I desperately wanted more of it. But it's it's like um, it's all they're all. It's very like it's not a magical world. It's all it's like Harry Potter with like math and puzzles, basically. Like like mm. each of the kids, the sort of protagonists, the little group of children, are brought together because they all have some unique kind of way of thinking. So like one of them is like really good at like puzzles and pattern recognition, and one of them is like super well read and full of trivia and has like a. Uh, photographic memory and then one of them who was a little girl which i really liked is like the fix it kid like she got like a little bucket full of tools and she can like fix anything um Mm. and so they're brought together by this guy named mr benedict who is trying to infiltrate a children's school where he thinks something evil is happening so he needs sort of a group of little like kid spies to infiltrate (laughs) this school together and find out what's going on and then you know and stop it um but it it but you find like so much of it is like, you know, puzzles and riddles. And so you, the reader are able to kind of solve along with it, but it it scratches that same itch of like, all of them are, you know, sort of like troubled home lives or complicated relationships with their parents or don't get along with the other kids in school or, um, or, you know, didn't go to school or, you know, whatever. And, and, and they're sort of brought together in this way. And I just was reading it thinking like, God, like I read them as an adult, but just thinking like, God, this would have been like right in my wheelhouse when I was like eight years old, you know, like, Oh, this is like, yeah. Amazing. But yeah. And that was, and I love the X-Men too, the X-Men. Cause I, you know, I was an eighties, nineties kid. And so the X-Men for me and my sister was the number one preferred game at the video arcade because it was mm. the only one where you could both play as girls it was the only oh, wow, one of those yeah. sort of classic arcade games that had, I think, three that like multiple, like you could choose what female character to play, which absolutely no other one of the games at the time did. You had like I one game, you know, if you're that. lucky. Um, yeah. And uh, and so, you know, like I, she'd be Storm and I'd be Rogue and we would like do a little thing. And it was so, yeah. So we were we were very much an X-Men household when I was a child. That was a good one. We all, everybody wants a Professor X, I think. Everybody wants to sort of be like <laughs> plucked from obscurity and get to live in that house and have Patrick Stewart tell you he's proud of you. Like that's the dream, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we can finally get to the last question. Yes. And uh, knowing how you like to, you you like stories that have a positive ending. Let's see if this one does. Like when you look back at those early interests in writing and some of your early poetry, or even your uh, your stint at acting when you got into college, uh, how do you feel about those first pursuits? I, you know, it's interesting. I, I mean, I feel. I feel benevolently towards them. I, I am. I'm very much. You know, I'm still. I'm still a writer in the same you know, sort of in the same worlds that I was then, you know, the things that I write plays about now are, are, you know, I think touching on some of the same themes as the stuff that I was really interested in then, like my, my most successful play, which is called Dear Galileo is about sort of interplay between, between science and Catholicism. And it follows three different sets of a father and a daughter where the father is like a famous scientist which one is Galileo and then the kind of complicated relationships that their daughters have with them. And it's all sort of over this kind of faith and science divide and, you know, big ideas and this sort of notion that like science and religion and art and exploration are all different human ways of looking at the world that are kind of asking the same big questions, you know? Mm. Um, and then, but the interesting thing that's about, um, you know, with my book, so I, I wrote a, um, my book is called The Rewind Files. It came out in 2015 and we're in the process now of revising it for republication because when it was written, it was sort of just a standalone book. And now it's really the the entry point to a trilogy, which means we have to sort of Ooh. like tink- tinker with some stuff, kind of nice. open up some some bows that were tied too neatly at the end of the first one. Um, this is your Shannara. Yeah, it, exactly. And and the <laughs> thing that's been so interesting about it is, so, you know, I'm, I'm now in the process of revising a book that I wrote 10 years ago. And, and kind of concurrently with that, I... I moved into like I moved into a new house last year and part of the process of that was I went through about seven boxes of sort of miscellaneous like you know memorabilia from childhood through my 30s that I had sort of just been moving from apartment to apartment and house hmm. to house my whole life and I finally was like my god I go through this stuff and a lot of it was early writing you know everything from like high school papers to like you know childhood poetry and journals and things like that. And I, and I read every single, I didn't keep, you know, most of it, but I, but I read everything. And that had to have been, uh, 
fun in some ways and not so fun in others. Yeah, it, and but it was really profound in a way, and I and I'm feeling sort of similarly revisiting my book where it's like, you know, I'm in my 40s now, and I think I have a capacity to look back at that younger Claire, particularly I think with the sort of the more kind of teenage ephemera stuff, where it was mm. like to see that Claire as a as a kind of distinct whole person and and what she was trying to do through her writing and the stories that she was trying to you know place herself in where you're just like like I can see now like I see where that was coming from you know that it was like writing writing stories about you know, finding like a found family and a friend group because at the time you were really lonely or writing about wanting to go like have a big adventure because you didn't have sort of the emotional capacity to understand yet that really dramatic and exciting stories can be made out of small everyday things, you know, like that you can have an interesting life, even if you never like kill a dragon or go to space, you know? (laughs) Um, And, and just really, I got, yeah, I just, I remember like, you know, just sitting over the course of like two weeks, like sitting on my bed and just reading through like, yeah, all of my, like all of my cheesy adolescent poetry and first drafts of, and my like, you know, things that were like so old that I was like writing them on, you know, on paper by hand because I didn't even have the computer then. And, and I just, I, I think, yeah, I think it really gave me, it gave me a, a, a perspective of that version of myself as though I, a woman in my forties was like looking at a 16 year old and the kind of mm. empathy that I would have for a 16 year old who wasn't me. I, Cause I think it's so much harder to like give that kindness to ourselves. Like we're very like judgmental of our own past stuff where you're like, no teenagers deserve some grace, but I personally was garbage, you know? (laughs) Um, And, and I think in some ways that was a really important exercise to go through prior to cracking this book back open, you know, and, and I think every writer love, you know, loves the idea of getting a shot at, like punching up your jokes 10 years later where you're just like, every yeah. time I, you know, I open that book and dip back into it to like fact check something for the second book. And I'd be like, God, I can't believe I used the word suddenly twice in the same sentence and nobody <laughs> stopped me. Like, you know, you fix it on like, like, Oh, that comma should have been a semicolon and I'm never going to get over it. Yeah. So I think being able to like, to, to go back in, you know, as a writer who is now 10 years better at writing it is like a real gift but i i also i've been really intentionally approaching it like from the point of view of trying to rather than like you know judging or being critical of that younger claire for the things that she didn't know then or for the limits of her capacity based on you know being 16 or you know (laughs) or whatever or you know or like that you know writing her first book, you know, I, I think, I think it's important to sort of give yourself some, some grace and look at it more as like, okay, like what was she trying to do, you know? And, and what was, and why was the story important to her, you know? And, and so I think, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say, I encourage everyone to go back and read your most cringeworthy middle school poetry because sometimes it really, I mean, some people would just walk into the sea and never come back. Like, you know, it's, they can be really, really bad. And I, and I certainly would never share it publicly. But I think just as an exercise in, in like reminding myself that like even in the really bad stuff, you're like, there's something here. Like there's something like, yeah, baby Claire was like found some nugget of something that she was interested in exploring and whatever that nugget was like I'm still I'm still digging into it you know like whether it's the Catholicism or you know or fantasy or science fiction or you know things about that world building there are things that I really was fascinated by wanting to kind of crack open and look at when I was 12 that in yeah. some ways I'm still cracking open and looking at now in a much more different style of work well, it, it's all uh, incredible, and I feel like everything that you're describing and what you're doing, it you're truly engaged with uh, what you create, and it feels like one of the, the the best way to be engaged with your own life is to be truly engaged with uh, with your the crafts that you love, and I you're doing so. all of that. <laughs> I, I I mean, I I think that writing is something that everybody should do. You know, obviously, like not everyone like can publish a book or have a play produced or whatever. But the act of being creative is something that's like available to everybody, and I think everyone's lives are improved for doing it. 
And that's the show. Big thanks to Claire Willett for joining me on the podcast. For more information about Claire, visit ClaireWillettWrites.com. Freddie Nunez created and sings the You Are the Genre theme song, and Adam Smith produced it. Next episode, comedian Tim Platt joins me on the podcast. But if you become a paid subscriber to the newsletter, you can listen to that a week ahead of the normies. Basically, right now. This is Tim Barnes signing off with your weekly reminder that you are the genre. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things. That specifically.